There we go. Okay, thanks so much, Emily. Okay, guys, we're on page five. We're gonna follow the bottom right-hand corner. And let's do a quick review. We did a lot last class, but some really amazing and important information. We started to speak about the idea of mitzvah being Adam l'chavei, between us and each other. We, you know what we didn't mention, by the way? We didn't mention something quite important. And that is this idea of mitzvah being Adam l'makom, write that down, Bain Adam l'makom, and Bain Adam l'chaveiro, which is the opposite, right? Between us and each other. Bain Adam La Makom, if you remember from last semester, and Bain Adam La Chaveiro, okay? Between us and each other, between us and God. One of the names of God is Makom. Actually, I don't know if I remember, I mentioned it, but it's an important point. You can actually see this represented, visually we mentioned, we mentioned this last semester, on the Luchot, right? On the Ten Commandments. We said, right, we have five over here and five over here. And we said that both, one of them is between us and God, and it's between us and each other, and they are separate but equal. We give them equal weighting. So last semester, we were doing the first five, and all the commandments come out of the first five, and now this semester, we're doing the second five between us and each other, okay? Us and each other, our fellow man or woman, as the case may be. So we start by looking at a pasuk in Vayikra, and we saw over there that a person should not distort justice, don't favor the poor, don't honor the great. Lot asu ava mishpat, lot isa pene dal, vi al tedar, pene gadol, betzedek tishvot metecha. With righteousness, you should judge your fellow. That was on page three, new students, top of page three. We looked at the Gemara, we looked at the Rashi, we looked at the Chinuch, and we went through and looked at uh, another couple of sources on that. So the question I want to look at today, bottom of page five, is. Are you meant to be lying to yourself? Someone does something to you. We did the example, remember, of the bank robber running out of the bank, yeah, with a mask on his face, with a big bag that says swag on it, with dollar bills flying out. Are you meant to imagine your So since he's part of our community, I don't know who this person yeah. is, part of our community, he what does. assumptions are we, uh, should we make? So the assumption we should make is, he's making a mistake. Because of that, you may go up to him and say, like Emily said, just go up to him and speak to him and say, oh, by the way, I'm not so sure that this Hersha is really, you know, you should be consuming as an observant Jew. But in my mind, what am I meant to think? This actually happened. There's a famous story in a book about a rabbi who actually lived here in Manhattan. And he saw the president of the synagogue, a religious, the president of the shul, a religious Jew, 
and he saw him go up to this hot dog truck, some kind of like non, very non-kosher, like super, extra non-kosher, you know, with an extra hechsha. This is not kosher. Grab food and eat it. And he didn't get a chance to, and he wanted to embarrass the guy by going up to him in public. So he wrote that he had to try to formulate in his mind a scenario that what this guy was doing was correct. How could he have done that? How could he have done that? So you could got a veggie dog that happened to have a kosher hexer on the packaging and it was cooked in separate water or okay. something. So that's pushing it a little bit. Try to imagine that really it is a kosher hot dog. Let's say he knows it's not. Yeah? Can you hear the starving That, that would do it. Starving at the point about to die, you're allowed to, you know, have to give up your life for... He actually approached him. You're allowed to do that. If you're about to die, you're allowed to eat uh, such food. He actually approached him after thinking out the following scenario. He said, it must be he's not well. It must be he needed this, right? And it must be there's some condition he's got that makes him need, and he approached him and said, I saw this, he goes, thank you so much for coming up to me and asking me. Right? I didn't even see you there, or I would have told you at the time, but I have an extreme case of some kind of blood disease, and the doctor told me, if I'm hungry, I have to eat straight away, no matter what it is, otherwise, for my age and what I have, it's life-threatening. The guy told the rabbi this and said, that's actually the truth. He said, I have this disease, as soon as I get hungry, I must eat straight away. If I get to a certain point of hunger, and I forgot to eat in, and I didn't have my tablets, or whatever I take that day, and that was it. Happens to be, it happens to be true. Happens to be that that was a scenario. So the rabbi got it right. He, he was lekaf dan schot, remember that expression from, me, from last class? He gave him the benefit of the doubt. Happens to be that that's true. The point is, even if it wasn't true, and he was just a faker, right? who got hungry, couldn't be able to walk another block to find something kosher, but was hungry and ate this instead. The rabbi or the power, or anyone, is expected to try to find that scenario. So the question is, are you expected to lie to yourself? It happens to me in this case, the rabbi was right, but are you expected to lie to yourself? So actually, here's a very interesting piece that helps us put this into a little bit more perspective. And this is Rav Shlomo Volbi, uh, who was a great rabbi who lived not that long ago, actually. Uh, interestingly, like his daughter-in-law was my shatan. She set me up with my, my wife. And he says, what are you meant to do when it comes to judge people? Are you like maybe crazy? Are you meant, like, what, are you, what, are you, what are you doing? And he says like this. He gives the mechanics behind it. And he says, Adam Lekafskot wrote there once, bottom of page five, bottom of page five, you got it? Ro you okay? Ah, oh, there you go. That's very nice. Rose says Shechavero wants that his friend Yezakai Umachapes and is going to look for ways, Drachim, Kate said Lavin, in order to find Mas of Shu Al Sad Kavanatova on the side of good. You've got to work at it. Like we mentioned last class, just do you work on trying to do a mitzvah well, trying to keep Shabbat, trying to, uh, I don't know, help someone, it takes work. This also takes work, it's not easy to do this. You're gonna to try to find some way, some scenario in your mind, not you're fooling yourself, that's the key point. You're not gonna to lie to yourself, Emily, and be like, okay, I'll just find some random thing, and uh, maybe it's his twin brother. I, you're not gonna find some ridiculous, you know, what you're, well, that would work actually. But what you're trying to do over here is, I, I'm, I, I hope it's true. That's what you think. I'm going to try and hope that it's true. You have to look with A, and this is a key word over here. You're meant to have a good eye. That doesn't mean you have to have 20-20 vision. There are two things we speak about. Ayin hara, which everyone talks about, everyone's obsessed with. Right, the ayin hara. Right? But the opposite of ayin hara, the bad evil eye, is the ayin tova. This semester is actually all about Ayin Tova. Forget the Ayin Hara, right? And the red blaze, bracelets and the, uh, you know, and the fish eyes on the bracelets and rings and the hamsa, all that kind of stuff. Forget that. You can't. You can't forget, I know. It's like, it's, it's, it's really, it's really in you. You gotta, you gotta, someone's gonna pay 36 bucks for a red bracelet, but they come to me. 
I got, you know what? The only thing I regret, Lara, is not selling the red bracelets for 30, for 36 bucks before the, 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 the Kabbalah people did. I should have. Yeah. Should I cashed in on that one? It's anyway. Funny. Okay, you can anyway. buy gold and buy yarn and you'll, it's fine, you'll make a killing. Okay. I will do. So, Ayin Hara is not what we're into. Ayin Tova is the opposite. Ayin Hara, we said, is looking at people, being jealous of them, thinking bad for them, wanting bad for them. That's Ayin Hara. Ayin Tova is I look at people, I want good for them. We need to change the Ayin Hara. You know what? I had a great idea. Lara, we're going to be rich. Rather than these red bracelets everyone's doing with the Ayin Hara, we should make bracelets for Ayin Tova. Isn't that a great idea? You don't seem convinced that this... I think it's a great idea. I, 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 exactly. <laughs> the good eye. Bam! That's the next big thing. Ayin Tova. I'm trademarking that, by the way. Okay. So he says, a person has to look with a good eye. What's a good eye? That means you have to try to find... Ayin Hara is, why does a person have that? I'm jealous that I deserve it. Right? They should have it taken away from them. That's the Ayin Hara we said. Right? Which stems from jealousy. This is the opposite. And by the way, this is the Mida, Pirka Avot says, of Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu was Ayin Tova. He always thought good for others. And by doing that, he was able to bestow blessings and barachot onto others as well. So he says, Kol kach yesh sakel ba'ayin tova al kol adam onto every person. The rasod dafka l'rot kol masav novim makor tov. You're going to try to see every action they do from coming from a good source. Even if they do something not so good, even to you, you're expected to try. This is Jewish law. Try to find that actually what they did was good. Okay? They were in a bad mood, maybe they're hungry, maybe they're tired, maybe they failed their exam. You know? This is tough. I tell you, I'm this, I really, a hundred Yom Kippur's is easier than this. Once. Someone does something nasty and says, changing your head to kind of open your head that actually maybe they're having a bad day, maybe the reason they're doing this is for reasons outside their control. Yeah. Um, in the beginning, whenever he confronted the guy with the working house, which is what I forgot, did you ask him if it was not kosher? Because you know how he said, like, it's with the judge and favorably. So, by asking so I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't ask. You could ask him. There's no doubt about it. If you do it in an embarrassing way. I wasn't there. This happened to another rabbi in the city. Right? Her name was Rabbi Shimon Schwab. Okay? He lived in Washington Heights. And he wrote about this. Right? As a lesson about this concept. And he saw this guy, the president of his shul, eat his non-kosher food. He didn't approach him right there and then. But he had to, before he approached, he had to figure in his mind what was going on. And that's, and it happens to be, he got it right. But my point is, even if it was wrong, he still have to try to do it. So why, um, <clears throat> so for an example, if someone tells you to keep Shabbat, but you see him breaking Shabbat, you know, I mean, it's not the book or something like that. <laughs> you still got to do it, but it's a fair question. You got to try to figure it out. You've got to try to figure it out. The but person says the Shema Shabbat, and you see him driving along with the whole thing. I know, and still in your, you shouldn't be like crazy, right? But at least in the beginning, you should, it's got to be something happening. It cannot be this person would do that to me. It cannot be this person would be rude to me. They're just such a nice person. It can't be they would ignore me. It can't be they let the elevator close in my face without trying to press the open button. It can't. You've got to try to do that. That is the halacha we're looking I mean, at today. That's a bad friend because they lie. That's, that's the point. They're not. That's the point. That's the not. You're trying in your mind to find a scenario that they're not. That's your obligation to the other person. No, it's actually not so important about them. What they do is actually kind of irrelevant. It's how you accept it. It's how you put it into your own mind. Just take a step back because you don't want to be a friend of a liar, right? I mean, I don't know, like, I'm trying to think. It is, I, I hear you. Like, if the president of the school is eating crap. What you shouldn't do, what you shouldn't do is think, this person's a liar, he's a trickster, he's a complete fraud. If you validate it, then it could be. But at the point, uh, right now, you, you shouldn't. Do, if you're able to validate that, and okay. if you're able to say, the emet, right, the honcho, then already it's a. Uh... And then what? Okay. Like just so then there's that. a. That's, then we move into a whole different area of Judaism. All right? Are you expected to go up to people, speak to them, give them tochacha? That's a different thing. I'm not even there. We're talking now how to deal with your own conception of most people. Because most people, when they do stuff, don't do it deliberately and not bad people. How do you believe that? Okay, let's just finish off the piece. 
These are good questions, but we're going to get more. So that's the ayin tovah kol adam l'rotzot dafka l'rot kol masav, right? November makot tov mikan she anut tzurichim lechapes. We are obligated to to find to examine, right? Etzel bnei adam dafka malot. Always trying to find the good character in people. That is your obligation. By the way, I can tell you a thousand stories from the Gemara about this, and we'll look at a bunch of them about this idea. Always trying to find the good in people. You're going to. Everybody in this world you're going to find is divided into two groups. Those who always have something bad to say about people, and those who always try to say Not to metalim, okay, which is immediately notice other person's shortcomings and ignore their strong points. They ignore the good stuff and always focus on the bad. Turn over the page. Turn over the page. That was kind of like the conclusion of the last class. Let's have a look at a Mishnah in Pirke Avot, bottom of page six. And the Mishnah says the following. Let's do these words inside. Yehoshua ben Perachia, the Rabbi Shua, the son of Perachia, Omer, very famous Mishnah. Aser l'charav. What does that mean? Aser l'charav. Yeah, there's two possible interpret ways to read this according to Hebrew grammar. Aser l'charav means maybe find yourself a rabbi who will guide. Guys, even rabbis, even rabbis need rabbis. Okay, how else can you read that though? You read. Aser <laughs> yes. lecha. No, no, it doesn't say aser lecha rav. Aser lecha or lach rav. How can you how, if you read the grammar differently? What else can it read? Like choose for yourself a rabbi. No, that's the same thing she said. Choose for yourself a rabbi. Something, but aser lecha rav. Make yourself into a rabbi. Nachan? Uh, uh, ah, that's what the Farshim say. Make something a rabbi, make something a rabbi. Ever become a rabbi? And the answer is that. doesn't mean literally a rabbi. Make yourself into a person who's intelligent, smart, and knows how lucky yourself. Don't always and constantly rely upon other people. Learn Torah and know what to do. Can you see that? Let's just change the vowels. Asel lecha rab and asel lecha rab. Asel lecha. You put the emphasis somewhere else over there. See it? Okay. But the basic interpretation is, find yourself a rabbi. Everyone needs a rabbi. The kanel chaver. Now, what is that? Kanel chaver. We'll break down this mishnah. I'll get your little yellow highlighters out and start to translate these words underneath. Kanel chaver. What does the word kanel mean? Who said that? Who said that? Buy. B u i. The word kanel means to buy. What? Buy? Is the Mishnah telling us to buy friends? Yes, actually it is. What does it mean buy friends? And like, you want to be my friend? No. Here, take a thousand dollars. I'll be a friend. By the way, I am buyable for those who want to know. Okay. The basic understanding is you should acquire for yourself. They usually translate as acquire yourself a friend. But it doesn't say that. It says kanelacha. And what that means is, when you want a friend, you've got to spend your resources in order to acquire them and to keep them. Nothing wrong with that. I'll do stuff for you. So the word kane is used specifically, like not, to buy. Meaning I'm not going to buy to be my friend, but I'll do stuff for you, I'll help you out. I'm there. In order to have and keep friends, which is important, you've got to actually do something to acquire them. 
You don't have to buy for yourself a rabbi. You've got to make one for yourself. You've got to put effort into that. But kenel hachaver, okay? Having a friend involves, which is important, involves doing stuff for them. And if that involves sometimes financial loss to yourself, through time, money, effort, that's part of it. Friends don't come for free, and that's okay. And that's okay. I mean, your friendship shouldn't be dependent upon what you give them. But that's, that's part of it. Okay, so there's two parts over there. Asselacharab, And then it says, Have they done? You should, Dan means judge. Et kol hadam lekafzuchot. Now, what do those words mean? Et kol hadam lekafzuchot. Yes, Leo? Um, the kol hadam is for every person, kafzuchot is back under the doubt. Beautiful. Give them the benefit of the doubt. So, kind of like what we're discussing right now. Okay, my two Israeli speakers, I come to you again. That's not actually the little translation. What is kol hadam? What should it have said for every person? What should it have written? Kol anashim. Kol anashim or kol adam. Nachon? That would work. Yeah, without the hey. That would work. What does kol hadam literally mean? Oh, every the man. <laughs> exactly, every the man. Doesn't make sense. So we translate to all people, it's all people, kol hadam, but it would say kol adam. The, the, the verse would mean the same thing if it said kol adam. It says kol ha'adam. So it actually says all the man, or oh, not man, the person actually. Adam is a reference to humanity. Why kol ha'adam? Every letter in Torah has relevance. There's a reason they put that hey in there, and there's a lesson from it. And you want to look at a person in their totality. That's one interpretation, which I didn't bring down, but write this down, it's a very important concept, okay? The extra hay concept, and it goes like this. Let's say I have a um, relationship with a friend, and this is a good friend, and you know what? They're nice to me, they're kind, they do a lot of good stuff, but sometimes they just drive me crazy. There's one thing they do that drives me crazy. Whatever it is, you know, they belch during lunch, I don't know, they scratch themselves, They while you're talking to them, they check their phone. Whatever it is that just drives you crazy. What you're expected to do, according to this concept of the extra hay, is look at the entire person. Don't judge them on the one small thing that irritates you. By the way, this is the answer to a good marriage. Trust me. Because your husbands are going to drive you crazy. It's going to be one thing they do that drives you mad. It's just going to happen. I know there's one thing I do which drives my wife crazy. Do you know what it is? For some reason, I don't know why, when I'm thinking of doing something, I bang my teeth with my thumb. I do this. Like that, right? So I sit there, and then I play a tune by doing that. I can actually do, like, a Beethoven overture just on my teeth, right? I say, how? I've always had it as a kid. I don't even notice I'm doing it. It drives my wife crazy. She's like, please stop banging your teeth with your thumb. Does my wife hate me? No, she loves me. But I annoy her when I do that, which I do all the time. Right? <laughs> what she's able to do, God bless her, she's a sedekit. I mean, the fact she's married to me already shows that she's either crazy or a very righteous woman. She's able to compartmentalize that and not hate me in totality because of that one annoying trait. She's able to look at kol ha'adam, the entire person. Yes, Lawrence drives me crazy when he does that, but I'm going to focus on the 99%. A person could focus on the 1% of annoying traits of another person, but that's not kol ha'adam. They're just focusing on that person. You understand the pshat of adam and ha'adam? So we're expected to look at the entire person, everything they do, and like, you know what? They annoy me, right? They, you know, what's your husband going to do that annoys you? He's going to leave the socks next to the bed, or he's going to scratch himself with his keys. He's going to do a lot of, right? Whatever it's going to be, he's going to drive you bonkers, yeah? So you're expected, I'm going to find that one thing and say, like, but that's not the entire person. The entire person's a good person. And most people you know, that you're friends with, chaver, because you've, most of the stuff they do is just, they're okay, they're just good people. They're good people. They'll just do something that annoys you. You can't judge them based on that one bad thing. Okay. Now, I want to ask you a question. I don't know the answer to this question. When the Mishnah, in Birka Bart, mentions a few things, they seem out of, Disconnected one from the other, but they must be connected. The Pharaoh of Shukran Prachia gave these three things 
in this order, one after the other, is for a reason. So look at the Mishnah. Let's analyze it for a few moments before we see the Rambam and see what he has to say about it. All right, when it starts with Torah, we look at it, we try to figure it out ourselves, then we see what the Rambam has to say. It says three things. Number one, make for yourself a rabbi. Number two, acquire for yourself a friend. Number three, judge every person or the entire person on the side of merit, give them benefit of the doubt. Someone like to just throw out a possible reason why that's the order and those three things were put in there together. Does everybody understand the question I just asked? Yeah, are we together? Rachel, are you with me? You following the question? Great. Leo, are you with me? You want to give an answer? I'll try my very best. You go right ahead. Um, I just think it starts like really with yourself and then it slowly like gets out into the world and to like other people. So then it's like make yourself rabbi. So like control yourself and then with your friends, so like a little bit further out. And then like every other person, which like may not be your friend, by like I think it's like a little Leo bit. Leo leaving. Yeah. I am extremely impressed with that answer. Do you hear what she said? This was greatness. Write that down. That's a nice one. I didn't even think about that. We said there's three relationships we have, right, between us and ourselves, between Adam and Atzmo, between Adam and Chaver, between us and each other, between Adam and Makom, between us and God. She says, you know, maybe the Mishnah is starting is like concentric circles. It starts with ourselves. First of all, you got to fix yourself. Oh, I like this, Leo. You give me a devout Torah for Shabbos. Start with yourself. A selach means for you. You need a rabbi to work on yourself. You know what? You need to know what to do. Then, and only then, can you start to deal with other people. I believe this is true, by the way. I think this is Peshat. I believe this is Peshat. I think this is the, the, the meaning of the Mishnah. Then you start to deal with your friends. Get yourself friends. And then it's how to deal with friends, which really your relationship to Hashem is how you deal with other people as well. So it goes from personal to the next circle to the next circle. <whistles> Snap. I like that. Well done. Is that your answer to Emma? No. She had her hand up. That was nice. That was nice. That was very, very nice. Okay, good, 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 good. Anybody else want to throw in? You know, they say that every piece of Torah has shivit panim, 70 facets, 70 faces to every piece of Torah. So you can take one idea and you can regurgitate it again and again. Half the kuppah, half the kuppah, everything's inside you. Okay, that was good. That was that cute. I like that. Okay. Let's see the Rambam. We saw Lior. Now we see the Rambam. Now we're ready. Okay. Says the Rambam on this Mishnah, kol, hadam schut. He says, Inyano kishia adam, shilotadavo im sadik imurasha. Who are we talking about over here? Who is it? He's focusing on the last part. Who are we talking about a person you have to judge? He's like, tell you the truth, this is his opinion. We're dealing with someone who you do not know whether they are a tzaddik or a rasha. A good, really good person or a really bad person. Why? He says, In such a case, if you see a person and you're not sure if they're really, really good or really, really bad, you're kind of like, I don't know. That's the person you have to give benefit of the doubt. Why? Who's the really, really bad person? So that's a person who habitually does terrible things or is running out the bank, you know what I'm saying, with the mask on, with the bag on his back, shooting stuff. Mm -hmm. Let me try to find a scenario. This person's doing a good thing. Before I call the cops, maybe they're going to a costume party, right? And they're getting ready for Purim. You know? No, call the cops, right? Do that, that's a rasha. That you're not expected to try to find. That's an extreme. How about a tzaddik, a righteous person? There's, you know, there's no work over there. It must be they're a good person. It cannot be they would even do something. I can't even, it doesn't even take the work to do it. We talk about the people in between, and by the way, most people are in between these two, right? Those are two extremes. 99% 9 of people fall in between this rubric, all right? These, these boundaries, okay? And you're expected to find a scenario that he did is not so bad. As he says at the bottom, 
Tzarech B'derech Hasidah Shetadin L'Kav Zchut. This is really a praiseworthy thing to expect to do. So look at the top of page 7. You have Tzadik, you have Rasha, someone you don't know. According to the Rambam, this discussion is actually on group 3. On group 3. Okay? Oh, I said I didn't know the answer. Oh, okay. I asked you. And what's the... I didn't know. I just I said there's always a reason for the order. I think what Lior gave us was a good one, but something to think about. And if the, when the Rambam sends to like judge like those that you don't know favorably, does that mean like is he choosing one or the other? Meaning like your friend, you shouldn't, or he's just saying in general that like, you should do both. He's saying you should in the situation where you don't know. And what about when you do know them? Like your friend, oh no, that's the person. That's the person. That's the one you're judging. That, that, he, that falls directly right in the middle, and that's the person you're meant to do. Here, he carries on. Look at look at note two on page seven. Let's do it some more. And then we'll look at a story from the Talmud on this idea. Okay? I think it's maybe from here. He says, Aval Ibiya Adam no death. Should tzaddik before sun, or b'welat tovot? If a person is publicly known to be a tzaddik, always doing good stuff, right? The nira lo poel shakoli and avorim shu polra, and you see this person doing action that looks entirely negative. The enatam yechol achriel tov, ela b'dochei gadol v'efshar achok. You got to really go efshar achok far in order to barachal gadol great lengths. You got to go to great lengths. Good translation of those words in order to try to justify this person's actions. It's, you should try to do it. You should try to do it. If there's one possibility, you shouldn't try to suspect them of having done something wrong. Now, the whole we just started the semester. We're going to have to go through and try to figure out in a lot more detail this. For example, the laws of Lush and Hara are now gonna interpose with this idea. Right? If a person has a bad reputation, you hear something bad about someone, are you allowed to say something bad about them? Right? Are you allowed to tell other people about them? That's gonna play on this as well. Okay? Um, you hear that someone is a thief. Someone tells they're a thief. Or you see, see them doing a thieving act. Or you're allowed to believe it and not do business with them, are you expected to deliver and do business with them, and let's tell other people that they're a thief so that they don't do business with them. These are questions we're going to analyze this semester. I'm not going to answer those now, but those are real questions that are related to this. Can you see that connection? It's very, very important. The laws of Lodosh and Hara, which we're going to study in detail later on in the semester, towards the end, is how we kind of like fix that in. Okay? But on a basic, at least beginning level, we're going to have to try... Am I expected to try to figure it out and see them as being a good person? So the Gemara gives a very interesting story about Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Eliezer ben Hurkunus. Rabbi Akiva was very poor. And he started to work for Rabbi Eliezer ben Hurkunus for three years. And by the way, people used to... that Rabbi Akiva was preparing to leave to bring his wages home to his wife and children. He'd been away for a long time. He wants to bring the Parnassa home. Rabbi Akiva asked Rabbi Eleza for payment of his wages. He said, Rabbi Eleza, can I have the money? Rabbi Eleza replied that he had no money to give. Although Rabbi Akiva saw that he had money. Oh, so now we're dealing with money. He worked for someone. He like, you know, I worked for three years. I want to go home and take the money that is owed to me, so I can, you know, feed my wife and kids. And he says, I'm sorry, I got no money. Rabbi Kiva looks around and sees the guy's got fields, he's got money, he's got cash. What's he expected to do? Yeah. Assume that 
because he was going to give it to four people or maybe he had to buy food for his family last minute just assumed that he was going to do something really good and he really or he owed somebody money and they would kill him if he didn't give the money he had to assume the best that the so money larry was... you're actually fulfilling the rambam the rambam says and you have to go you've got to really push yourself it, it can't be right Elizabeth Hawkins is the tzaddik of our generation he's a great and holy man it can't be I'm gonna to try to find some scenario Lara's like you know I'm gonna to try to find some scenario it's got to be that maybe the money's not his it's got to be that he can't afford to give it to me. He's got something going on in his family. This is, by the way, this is so difficult. Oh my goodness, I, I couldn't do this. I'm just saying, you know, right now, I could not do this. But Rabbi Kiva did. And look what happens. Later, Rabbi Eliezer paid the full wage that Rabbi Kiva left, and eventually, after a little bit of time, he paid him the full wage. Rabbi Eliezer asked Rabbi Kiva, did you suspect me when I refused to pay you in cash, even though you saw I had money? Did you, were you choshed me? Your Akiva said, I assumed you had found a bargain real estate investment for which you had set aside the money. Right? And he said, well, did you suspect me when I refused to pay you in pillows and blankets and land? And that sounds weird, but it used to be the pillows and blankets were a commodity. Right? And land, when you saw that I had them. And Rabbi Akiva said, turn over the page, I assume you had pledged all your assets to the temple. A person is able, according to Jewish law, to, well, they used to do this, to walk around their house and their property and be magdish something, make something hegdash and say, this land is not my land. I'm actually donating this or the value of this to the temple. As soon as they say it, it belongs to the temple. They cannot use it, right? That's, Eli, you're using holy property for your own purposes. Okay, then they would take the financial value of it and give it to the temple and now they would get that stuff back. That was what the people used to do. There's a lot written on this. So it's like, you know what? You saw I had land. Why do you think that I pay you a line? He's like, I assumed you, you made it hectish. Right? So he says, that's exactly what happened. Rabbi Eleza, my son, Horkunus, was not studying Torah, and to set him straight, I consecrated my property to the temple, basically, in the honor of his son, who wasn't doing so well, he said, I want to give tzedakah. So I, I consecrated my land, and I said, this land is not me, it belongs to the temple, I'm giving tzedakah. was not to be used, right? You found an investment and you set aside the money for the investment. I assumed the other stuff you had, you'd given to Sadaka. And he says, you know what, you're right. And he praised him. What's unusual about that story? Yeah. It sounds like the rich guy was setting up like the poor guy to give him like an opportunity. Oh, wow. Why exactly? So why did you just tell him? I just gave away my land. I want to, but this cash, I set aside for this. This, I set aside for that. And I'll owe you and I'll, I'll pay you in a month or so. Why don't you just say that? So Emily, answered very interestingly that maybe he was trying to teach his student Rabbi Kiva a lesson mm. right he was trying to push him trying to make an example out of him right it could be it could be yeah um, this is just kind of to add on it's also like um, normally like you don't have someone testing you you have to kind of do it within yourself but then in this time it was more like an external um, test or in our, like, I don't know, once you 
pass the external test, maybe it's easier to pass the test internally. Just because, like, normally you have to do it for yourself, but then when someone else is pushing you to do it, it's easier, like a parent, like, helping you. So you're explaining heart. Emily's answer. You're saying, had he done it for him, okay, fine, he owes it to me, and that's the end of it. Case, case closed, okay? But Akiba wouldn't have grown from that. Here, he had to find in his own. He was making him find ways in order to judge him well. I don't suggest you do this to your friends. But it's going to happen anyway. It's going to happen that you won't have a good excuse. Or you won't be able to get a chance to give them an excuse for why you didn't do something for them. Or why they didn't do something for you. You're still going to have to try to find the scenario. Maybe he was away. Right? Maybe he was in a rush. I don't know. It could be a thousand things going on. But it became an opportunity, what we call in education, a teachable moment. A teachable moment. Yeah? If, however, and this is important, jump to the bottom of page eight. If, however, you deal with someone who's not good, and they're consistently they're not good, and they're always doing bad stuff, This man, okay, he's in prison right now for embezzling three billion, but he's got a great deal coming up. Oh, I can't judge him on that three billion. Is it? No, no, judge him on the three billion. Don't do business with him. Like, that's great. But I see he's like trying to get, oh, are you okay? That's nice. That's nice, but it's not for me. Okay, you're not expected to start to invest in Madoff at this point of your life. It's just, it's just that's just insanity. That's great, Al. Uh, he was an individual who took a lot of money, who got very famous in the news. Okay. Let's look at a few scenarios, and we'll finish with this. Number one, you're at your local gym, getting dressed. You overhear a child say to his father, Daddy, these pants aren't mine. What are you meant to think? Probably the wrong pants. Maybe they're his brother's pants, all right? So his father says, it doesn't matter, just put them on, let's go. Don't think, this guy's allowing his kid to steal someone else's pants. He meant to think, it must be his brother's pants or something, or he doesn't realize they're actually his, you know? Now they, there's thousands of scenarios, which now you'll go through your day and you'll see there are thousands of scenarios like this. B, you're in class and waiting for class to start. Two students are talking and one whispers something to the other, and they both look at you and continue talking. You know that feeling? I think you walk into that two people are talking and they whisper and they see you and they start laughing. It's even worse. Like, oh my God. What are you expected to do? So you meant to try to find in your head a scenario that they're not talking about you. And by the way, they probably aren't. They don't even care, probably don't even see you. In most cases, they don't know you. you know? You have a good friend who lives in a different town, whom you speak to on the telephone every Friday while driving home. One Friday you call, there's no replies, so you try again on Sunday, after leaving three messages, that returns your call. Do they hate you? They disrespect you? They don't like you? What's the scenario? What are you meant to do? You meant to try to fight. Phone's broken, didn't get my message. I told you last class a story that happened to me. Someone got upset because I didn't return his phone call because he left a nine hour long message on my call, right? And I didn't know that he was by missing his son that Shabbat. So. 
And it knows that honest, most people make honest mistakes. Most people make honest mistakes. Something, another piece that I want to share to the next class, which is a good piece on this. Let's just let's just finish up. Okay, don't jump to page ten, please. We're just doing the sources. The bits in between you can read in your own time. Says Pirikavot, a beautiful idea, which many other cultures and societies have also begun using themselves as a concept. But I believe it comes originally from Pirikavot. Al tadin et chavrecha ad shetagia limkomo. Do not judge your friend until you reach their place. What does that mean? Do not judge your friend until you reach their place. Does that mean you can't judge until you arrive at their apartment? Okay, I've arrived in your place. I'm not going to judge you. This apartment is filthy. Do you ever clean up the kitchen? What is, it, what is going on over here? Rebecca. Um, so when I learned So don't judge someone until you're in the same situation that they are in. Okay? Don't judge someone until you're in their situation. But how is that possible? Is there ever a case when you are in somebody else's situation? Why not? One person is at school waiting in line. I'm also in line. They cut in. I don't cut in. They're cutting in line. I'm going to judge them. Well, We're in the same situation. Day. You didn't have their day. You didn't have their upbringing. Ah, so very, very good. So that's what we come back to. Et kol ha I don't know what happened to them today. I don't know what happened to them yesterday. I don't know what happened to them in their life right now. I don't know what kind of bad morning they're having. I don't know. Maybe they were diagnosed with something. Maybe their mother was diagnosed with something. Maybe their father was diagnosed. I see it. By the way, we live in a society now, by the way. We get a chance to do this all the time. Because it used to be. Not that long ago, you only kind of related to what's around you. And then suddenly television, and now internet, and now everyone's filming everything all the time. And so I see stuff, all the time of people doing stuff, which 20 years ago I would never have seen. I had it used to be. The people in your Daladama, those people around you, those are the people you have to deal with, and everyone else, I don't know what they're up to. Suddenly, I'm being stuck in a situation when everyone's filming everything and everyone's writing about it and putting it online and I'm getting to see everything. This has become a major challenge in our generation. Emily goes on vacation. She does something over there. I would never have known. I would never have seen it. Suddenly her friend films her, puts it online. I'm like, oh my God, that's Emily. Which would never happen in your case, Emily, right? Because <laughs> you're, you're very, right. right. I'm well, very nervous now. Very, very nervous. You know what? I'm also very nervous. I, I am very, very nervous. Everything I do is now being viewed. I, by the way, when I walk down the street, I'm gonna sound very crazy to you, okay? And it could be that I'm crazy, it could be, but when I see stuff happening now, and I'm in a public situation, I immediately think to myself, I'm being filmed, and it's gonna be put online, be very careful not to make a chilol Hashem. Because chances are, I could well be. There's a CCTV camera filming me. Someone's got the camera out. Right? I do or say something. Assume in 2016 that everything you do, say, write, email, is as though everyone in the entire world is reading it, seeing it. I'm, the, I'm giving you golden advice. I don't think it's a coincidence that Hashem has done us that favor. Now we're all having to behave ourselves much better. Hashem has made this whole social media world so that suddenly everything I do and say, you know that story recently of that girl who was a doctor, neurologist. You saw this one? Yeah. She ordered an Uber car. Yeah. She started punching the... She went, she was drunk. Okay, this is fascinating. She was drunk. <laughs> right, someone sent me the video. She was drunk. She got into the wrong Uber car because she ordered one. Someone else came first. She got into it, said, drive me. He says, no, this is not your car. Yours is coming soon. Or She went crazy, shouting, throwing stuff out. Had that happened 20 years ago, no one heard about it. But there was someone standing right next to her, 
filming it, it went online, she got kicked out, she's on suspension. I had to go, I had to go on television groveling for an apology. Okay. This was like She every, beat on the driver? Beat him up yeah. through a stop. Oh it was it was Oh my gosh, that poor guy. Oh it was that poor guy. Oh, that poor guy. Oh, she went into his car, taking was like throwing out the window. It was like it was like watching a train wreck. It was you saw this? It was crazy, right? She goes Now that would have never been seen. Now it's been seen, just imagine yourself wow. constantly being watched. And ultimately, it's true, because ultimately Hashem is seeing everything we do anyway, in public or private. That's painful, right? Advice for life. Judge everyone from their place. You're never in their place, which means you can never judge anyone. That's the honest truth. What about if you're in court of law and you have to judge someone? Ah. So, in a situation where your job is to be a judge on a bet din or a court of law, then you got to do it. Then you got to do it. I hear. But in most situations, it's not like that. Don't judge them negatively. Yeah. Um, what are, in general, the circumstances where you should intervene? And then, secondly, uh, so in the case of the hot dog and the rabbi, so we're talking about... The hot dog rabbi case, <laughs> of which you speak, <laughs> yes. So it's Avera ben Adam la Makom. So oh. my question is, if it's Avera ben Adam la Chaver, and I'm concerned, like, let's say, with the welfare of a child or a welfare of a beaten husband or a beaten wife, how do you, to which extent does this... Right. Excellent, excellent, beautiful, beautiful. We're going to look at this this semester, but I want to give you a short answer anyway because it's in your head and now everyone else's head. Okay, short answer is you're not allowed to stand by when you're the dam shel chavero nishbach where your friend's blood is being spilt. Meaning you're expected to intervene and to help people. Okay, that reply that applies to ben adam lachavero mitzvot and ben adam lamakom mitzvot. Don't stand by while your friend's blood is being spilled, is the expression of the Torah. Okay? You're expected to do something. Here, the rabbi felt an obligation, right, to judge him and then speak to him about this thing. Okay? The expression I want to share with you, which I don't want to do right now, but I'm going to mention now. You don't have to write it down if you don't want to, because we're going to look at it much later, which is. Kol Yisrael Arevim Zelazer. All the Jewish people are responsible for each other. This is true for any community, but for us Jewish people, we see our responsibility one to the other. Okay? Call Yisrael a Revim Zelazer. You know, I'm not going to do it right now because I want to get to it. I'm going to just throw it out. I want to put it and place it elsewhere. We're going to do a few classes on this, but this is really the source of it. You're responsible for your friend's physical welfare, emotional welfare, financial welfare. To what degree we're going to see, depends how close they are. Is it your friend? Is it your family? It's concentric circles. It starts with yourself, your friend, your family, your friends, your community, people in Israel. Right? There's going to be different layers, different circles. But you are responsible for them. He felt the responsibility. Does that mean if I walk down the street and I see a Jewish person eating something on kosher? Stop! Right? No, that's probably going to be insanity. Okay. But in general, what am I doing to try to better the situation of the Jewish people? That's for sure. That's for sure. So the short answer is, you are expected. You are expected. Okay, please remind me, because I want to go into more detail next class. I also, if someone remind me next class, I want to talk about the source of this, which is the argument between Cain and Hevel. Cain and Abel. So please remind me next class. I want to start the class with that, and then we're going to move on forward. Thank you. Good job, everyone. Thank you.